podcast, The Real Deal. I'm here talking to you from Washington, D.C., down on the waterfront at the wharf. I have a special treat for you today. I am interviewing Todd Thrasher, owner and founder of Tiki TNT and Potomac Distilling Company, a company that I personally have invested in. I'm going to meet with Todd and talk to him about how he acquired investors, how he found investors, what kind of promises he made for investors so that you too might understand how you can get investors to invest in your ideas and your businesses. I want you to stay tuned. We're going to go behind the scenes. We're going to look in this distillery. We're going to talk about how he came up with the concept. We're going to talk about his, his whole operation. You're going to get a never before view of what it takes to open a bar or restaurant or any kind of venue like this. Now you might wonder, why did I invest in the production of rum? I mean, given my Christian background, you know, that's kind of like taboo. Well, my thinking was, as African Americans coming into the United States and from way back in the 1800s in slavery, you know, black people were shipped to the islands to farm sugarcane so that they can make rum and sell it across the world. My take is, you know, we did it for free, why not make a profit from it? So that's why I invested in TNT. I'm gonna show you what it takes to do private equity investing too, and kind of what kind of returns and how you how the deals are formulated so that you too can make millionaire money moves. So I want you to click below so that you could see this 20 minute interview with me and Todd Thrasher so that you too can learn how to make millionaire money moves on my Millionaire Money Moves channel. Thank you. TNT Tiki Bar and, uh, and uh, Potomac the Selling Company, and I really appreciate you taking out the time. Of course, in the beginning. Right. So, and before you've owned, you've owned kind of like coffee shops. You've owned kind of little, you know, light fair restaurants yeah. and those types of things. But where'd you get the experience to run a bar such like this? You yeah. Know? So I, I own coffee shops and light fair. I also owned a super fine dining restaurant in Old Town Alexandria. I owned a fish and chips plot in Old Town Alexandria. I owned a, a massive 400 seat restaurant in Old Town Alexandria at one point. And it just got to be not, like, I knew where I couldn't make money as a coffee shop and I knew I could make money in the bigger places. Right, so so this was a lofty project though. I mean, you uh, had several locations and you decided to kind of window this down and focus just on this, but you're down here in the beautiful Washington DC waterfront. Rent's not cheap. You know, yeah, they bring a lot of traffic here, but you decided to go big or go home. Right. So what, you know, so, you know, you know, how did you, how did you, how did you come to grips with, you know, taking on such big risk and such a big project? Yeah, if you don't take risks, you're not going to get anything, right? right? I mean, you have to. The, this whole project came about but was Monty Hoffman, who's the developer of this whole concept. I used to own a, own a bar called PX. It's very good for the ego, not good for the pocketbook. Like <laughs> it was, you know, one of the best bars in America by. Playboy, GQ, Esquire, um, all these different things. He wanted me to open one of those down here. I'm like, I'm not really interested. He's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to open a rum distillery. He's like, you want to open a bar too? I'm like, no, I just want to open a rum distillery. He's like, what if I build a distillery for you and have to open a bar? I'm like, I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. And then they showed me a, like a rendering of what this building would be. I'm like, I want to do that. Right. And then, you know, honestly, I signed the lease over six years ago, the rents weren't terrible. And one of the things I wanted to make sure is, I didn't want to get caught in that rent escalation with landlords, so I worked it into my lease where I have no rent escalation for 15 years. Oh, wow, yeah. that's nice, that's incredible. So you're able, so a, a business owner can actually do that. They can negotiate you, no rent increases. You can negotiate anything you want, whether the landlord goes for it, you know, is another story, but you know, I think they wanted me. You know, you know I'm a bartender and I wanted to open a rum distillery and a bar at that point. And I think they just wanted me and they, they, they were gonna, do, you know, I didn't get everything I asked for, but I got a lot of what I asked for. You right. can ask, you have to be willing to ask for it. If not, if you don't ask for it, you're not gonna get it. Right, I get you. You know, it's interesting. I uh, vividly remember when you were putting this together and there were delays on, because this is a lofty project. It's like, it's new construction, plus yeah. you had to build out the distillery and the whole nine yards. Uh, can you give my listeners an idea of how many hours did you put in this thing? You know, getting it set up. Pre How many hours per day? How many hours per yeah. week? Yeah, pre-opening. So pre-opening, uh, 
there was from, I would say, when I signed the lease in 2015 to actually opening in 2018, probably seven days a week, five to six hours a day. Easy. Seven days a week, five wow. to six hours. That's pre-opening. Okay. So now you get to like, let's say we opened in December of 18. So I would say from October to December, I was probably putting in eight to 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And that's, I also had another consulting gig that I was doing at the same time. Wow. Yeah. So you were really grinding hard, right? Like crazy. So did it, so was it more work than you thought or was it about what you expected based on your experience? More work than I thought because I had no clue about the distillery. Right. Like the bar, the restaurant, whatever, I got that, like, like the back of my hand. But when you start to throw something in you don't know, like I practice at home on a 10 gallon copper pot still, right? Right. I have a 200 gallon still downstairs with four 200 gallon fermenters. I didn't know what I was doing. So that was more work than I thought. The bar and restaurant was not as much. Right. It was fine. So let me ask you this other question. Given that it took that it took so much of your time and you were so involved, how did you balance your time between work? Because I'm pretty sure you had other operations like your consulting, yeah. your family, and this new venture. And the other like, restaurant. Exactly. Yeah. And the other restaurant. So how did you never you know, work Sundays? Never ever. Never work Sundays. Never ever work Sundays. That's one of my things. I, you know, I may stop in and things like that, but I never ever work Sundays. Right. I, you know, I used to work Sundays and then it got to the point where, especially when we opened here, like I had to at least dedicate one full day to the family. Right. That was right. it. I mean, Todd, you know, I've been knowing you for several years. I knew your dad before I met you. So, can you tell my listeners who is Todd Thrasher? Give us your background, where you come from, how you, you know, ended up into this uh, big yeah. establishment. So on the back of the bottle it says, made by Todd Thrasher, husband, father, bartender, scuba diver. <laughs> That's it, right? I mean, it's kind of simple. Um, I went to college to be a fashion designer. Oh, wow. Yeah, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University and I didn't love it. And then I got a job bartending at nighttime. I loved it. Um, and that's how it all began, just, you know, doing a, a job at night that you actually liked, right? Right. There's a, a lyric from a, a song, it's called, the, the song is called I'm on Vacation, but the lyric goes, my lack of the lazy has led me to do what I love on the daily. Oh, nice. Like, like I just love bartending, and I got into it, and I loved it. And I just, if, if there was a shift to pick up, I would pick it up, and I would read books, read books, read books on liquor, read books on wine, all that stuff. And it just... Like since that day when I made that decision, I was probably like 23. Oh wow! And it just—it's been pretty easy since then. I mean, not easy, right? I mean, stress is out there, but, but it's a labor of love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you actually like what you're doing, and you know, you enjoy doing it. Yeah. yeah. So tell tell us about the products. So you you distill these four products here? Yeah. So actually, I distill a little bit more than that. Um, this is rum. So rum by nature can only come from sugar cane. So we get all our sugar cane from Lulu Westfields in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I tell everyone I make white rum and everything else happens from white rum. So I make white rum. That's the first thing we do. We make that every day of the week, seven days a week usually. Mm -hmm. um, today I'm not distilling because I'm cleaning today. Um, but we make from there we make coconut rum, which is no sugar added um, after distillation. No unnatural products, everything's natural. We make spice rum, think of like Captain Morgan's Sailor Jerry's. Again, all natural, nothing put in after distillation, no sugar added after distillation. I also make the green spice rum, which was named one of the top 100 spirits in the world by Wine Enthusiast Magazine last year. It's a white rum that's been infused with spearmint, lemon verbena, lemon balm, lemongrass, green cardamom, and lime. We also do a, a young aged gold rum. And then on August 16th, this year, we're going to release our first aged rum that's been barrel aged for two years. Wow. August 16th is National Rum Day. Todd is a famous, he's, he's famous in the DC area as a bartender. Like he's famous everywhere. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, he's famous everywhere. <laughs> but he's known, he's particularly known in DC as a, as a, as a, uh, as a mixologist right. and a sommelier, I understand. Yep. So my question is, how did you, wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna basically make rum. I mean, you, okay. you know, how'd you come up with a so recipe? Good, so it's a good story. How I finally decided this is what I'm gonna do, all right? I'm sitting in a bar in Wellington, New Zealand in March of 2010, and I look across the bar and there's a bottle of Pisco 
It's called Machu Pisco. Mm -hmm. My friend makes it. She lives here in DC, but she's from Peru. And I said, how cool would that be to be sitting in a bar halfway across the world and something you make is there? That's wow. how the whole idea started. So. Wow. And then everything just kind of fell into place after that. I started going, I went to friends that have distilleries, learn how to distill. I had a tin guy on copper pots in my backyard. Went to a place in um, Louisville, Kentucky called Moonshine University. And that's how it just all started. Then the recipe just came from, there's a rum in Guyana called El Dorado. Uh -huh. There's a rum in Jamaica called Appleton's. Mm -hmm. Two of my favorite rums are completely different. One is made primarily with um, Demerara sugar, and the other is made with molasses and sugar. I said if Appleton got together and Eldorado get, got together and had a baby, it was going to be Thrasher's Rum. Oh, nice. So that's how the idea and recipe, you know, I just started, you know, with Google and the internet, you can pretty much find anything you want, right? Right, right. So I just started Googling recipes and talking to people. I actually went to Appleton's, checked them out, and see what, saw what was going on. I have not yet gone to Eldorado, but that's kind of my next on my list. I want to go see them. Right. You know, a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book for African Americans talking about investing and, and, uh, and getting up the courage and, and overcoming their fear. My question is, did you have fear? I mean, you're going into new territories. You haven't done that. I mean, were, was there any fear that kind of made you kind of a little nervous? And what did you do to basically overcome that fear to kind of keep pushing forward? Um, so fear involved, right? So my number one fear is I have to put everything on the line to sign a lease. Everything. Your whole life, right? I mean, they, they want, you know, you have to put it down money. You have to sign over, you know, guarantees. So that was a big fear. Um, but I think you have to take risk in life. You right. just can't go through life taking the easy road. Right. So. One of the things that I say that, you know, there's an old saying that you conquer fear with action. And when I broke that down, it's like, it's really not action, it's really research, right? right? So when you're afraid of something, you research it because, and you break it down to smaller parts, you might find out that of the 10 things you're afraid of, there's only really two to be concerned about. And then you research more to figure out how am I gonna mitigate those two factors. Right. Right. And then now, I'm ready to basically move forward. So that's really, really helpful. The the uh, the other thing is like, so you, you you know, this is a big operation here. It takes a lot of money in the whole nine yards. So I, you took capital from investors. Did you use bank loans as well? No bank loans. No bank loans. Investors, investors in yeah. your own personal and A little bit of mine for the uh, original deposit in the lease. Right. So my question is, how did you find your investors? So one of the things I'm very lucky about is, because you said it, I'm a famous bartender, right? <laughs> um, no, kidding. Um, I met people in the bars, right? They would come to my other restaurants. Uh, they would talk about what's going on, what do you got going on next, what are you doing next? That's always a question for a lot of people, what are you doing next? Right. And when I started telling people about the rum distillery first, because like I said earlier, I wasn't really interested in opening another bar right. or a restaurant. I was kind of just wanted to do the rum distillery so I could work in the morning and get home and be with my child and be with my wife and, and hang out with them. Um, they were like, oh, that's very cool. I, I would be interested in opening a rum distillery or owning a rum distillery. You know, a lot of people want to be a part of something. Right. Right? It's not, a lot of people want to invest. Some people care very much about making all their money back as quickly as possible. Some other people want to just be a part of something. Right, right. And I, I, I kind of went for a combination of both. Some people that just want to be a part of something and people that, you know, Want, want it to invest to get their money back. You know, it is, a, it, investing's a gamble, right? Exactly. It's a gamble, you, you don't know. Right. But I think, you know, I knew how to run a bar. That's the one saving grace I had. I knew how to run a bar. I didn't know anything about running a distillery, <laughs> but I did know how to run a bar. I figured, you know, I could run a distillery and, and make it work. And you, you said research, right? So I researched distilleries. They pretty much hemorrhage money for the first three years of life. Wow. But when you have a bar upstairs to kind of balance help that it. out and balance yes. out, you can kind of make it go. And you know, I, I'm with Thrash Drum, I'm building a brand. Right. right. That's that's my whole goal is is to build the brand. It takes time to build. Uh, uh, so back on the investors track, I mean, so how did you know how much capital you needed? Right in a budget. Right. Yeah, so I you just, did it yourself. You yeah. No, no, I did all that myself. Right. Yeah. yeah. As far as the budget was. Uh, I raised about $150,000 too much for what I needed. Wow. But I also did a lot of stuff myself. You know, right. like, you know, you get in here and you're like, I'll give you an example. 
the chandelier over top of the bar. Mm -hmm. I did all that myself. Okay. All the rope, everything. So total investment on that chandelier over the bar was like three thousand dollars. Right. If I would have got someone to make it for me, thirty-five thousand. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah. So I mean, I'll, you know, some things I just like, you know, I can do that. Why not just do it myself? Right. And, you know, I would come in here. Mike, who is uh, the general manager here, he and I came in and we did that ourselves. So over you, the course of like a week. So you create a budget, and your budget was fairly accurate. My, my budget was yeah. I I. I I thought every other restaurant I've opened, I've kind of gone over budget. And right. this one, I wanted to make sure I stayed within the budget and, and kept it really tight because I wanted extra. I never, I've opened six restaurants before. I never ever had that extra cushion to get open. Right. And I always had just, just enough, enough. Right. to get open. Here, I wanted to make sure I had an extra cushion. So then, you know, I just started like, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Like, rather than use an interior designer, it looks pretty decent, I did everything myself. For, for those of you that are interested in private equity investing, the one thing that inspired me to do it was that, number one, I had a friend who valued money as much as I do or more, which is Rick Wheeler, who was all in. And Rick doesn't throw his money away. So that was something that influenced me. And then out of that, I've been in a couple of locations that taught his own, I see how he runs his business, and you know, there's a certain amount of the entrepreneur that is key to getting investors to want to invest in them. They have to come across extremely credible and trustworthy. And I can tell you, Todd has been extremely both trustworthy and credible and responsible. So if you want to get capital from investors, you know, the experience matters, you know, how you treat your investors matter. Like you said, be friendly, be nice. be nice to everybody. And also having a group of friends who have capital that are willing to invest in your so, ideas. COVID-19 hits. All DC bars, restaurants are affected. How did you manage that? Scared as anything, you know? Like, uh, one way we managed it is, I find myself very liberal on a lot of things. Like, everything in life, except finances. I'm very, like, fiscally conservative with finances. So we had a great year of 2019, and I had that just-in-case money set back, right? Mm -hmm. So I had the just in case money, and no one thinks COVID is going to last four months, like right. or like shut down. So I'm like, I had enough money to get through just in case. But you know, I, what I did, I didn't, I didn't take a paycheck. My wife didn't take a paycheck for four months. Wow. Um, everyone here went on unemployment. I mean, that's just the the nature of it. And I did have bills. You know, I had an AP that was, you know. It was like sixty thousand dollars at that point, so wow. I wanted to make sure I got my AP down to zero and had no bills to to last. So I could last through. The landlord was not the easiest thing to deal with wow. because they still want their rent, right? Uh -huh. they, they don't know how long it's going to go on. Um, the landlord did come around afterwards, and, and they did not give us any free rent. They gave rent deferment. Right. So I now you know you figure out how to pay your rent, you know, deferred. You know, like and you don't know how long COVID's going to last at this point. So we made it through by just being like fiscally conservative with money beforehand and during and, and still afterwards. Right, and so what was your message or uh, correspondence and communication with your investors and how did they respond? Uh, did I invest, did I, did I even respond to you all? <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 a letter. I got yeah, a I did give you a couple letters, you know, I mean, what are you gonna do? You right, know? exactly. And, and this is one of those funny situations too because some people, were drastically affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. Some people not at all. Right. I mean, everyone is obviously affected, but some businesses, you know, where the restaurant business was devastated, you know. And we're not necessarily a food destination. We're much more of a drink destination. Right. So, you know, whereas a lot of places we're doing to-go food and things like that. Right. I thought, and I, I talked with Matt, and I'm like, what do you think? And I'm like, my feeling is, I'm gonna lose more money than I'm gonna make if we do to-go food, to-go drinks and have staff here, why don't we just shut it down? And you know, I think it was made the most sense possible just to shut upstairs down. We shut down from March 12th to June 15th, completely right. shut down. I just thought it was the smartest thing to do so I wouldn't lose any more money, you know. Turn the lights off, turn all the air conditioning off, shut it down, see what happens. That's good, you know, as an investor, you have to understand it's extremely risky. As a private equity investor, you are an accredited investor, which means that you're financially in a position to take that risk. So I wasn't concerned at all, to be honest with you. Uh, first of all, because I invested an amount of money that if I lost it, it would not cause me to lose any sleep. 
And then number two, I had a lot of faith in Todd. I knew that he was going to do the right thing. And that when things turned around, that we were going to come back rolling. So that's exactly what's going on. I will say one thing happened during COVID. Whereas I shut up here where we are, the bars down completely. I kept the distiller on. Oh, good. So one thing I did was it gave me time to change things and to evolve as a distiller and not have to worry about the, the bar and restaurant. So I actually evolved as a distiller and the rum got much better. You honed your craft. I honed my craft. I, I, I honestly, we had 200 cases of white rum and I have 400 gallons downstairs. I emptied it all back and distilled, redistilled it and, and started looking at other things to do. And made, in my opinion, and I think, you know, with like this getting the, the accolades it has, we made a better product. So it allowed me to, to do something that I probably would not have been able to do if we were as busy as we were upstairs. In the and bar. what were those accolades? So that the Green Spice Rum top 100 spirits of the world by uh, Wine Enthusiast Magazine last year. Nice, it's nice. huge. I mean, yeah, yeah, nice yeah. I mean, 100 in the world. Yeah, it's that's almost good. being like famous. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So we're gonna move down to your distillery, and you can show us a little yeah. bit what's going on there, and uh, go from there. That's good. Okay, so um, let's start here. These are fermenters. I have um, four 200 gallon fermenters. So in, in here, we put about 160 gallons of water, put about 20 gallons of molasses and about 25 gallons of uh, raw demerara sugar, yeast, some nutrients, and fermentation happens. So we put it in at 0% alcohol. Hopefully after about seven days, we get it out about 9% alcohol, which has basically created the stinkiest and ter most terrible beer you've ever had in your life. Uh, and then from there, we put it into the still. So this is where the, the act of distillation happens. So this, like when we talk about moonshine, earlier, this is actually a copper pot still. This is called a column. So this, the name of this still is a hybrid pot, a hybrid pot column. So I have the ability to use it just as the, the copper pot or I have the ability to use it as the, the column. So what I do with these four tanks of, we call it wash in, in making rum and like whiskey and vodka, they call it mash and rum is washed. So I'll take one of these, I'll pop it into there. I'll turn on the still. And I will not use this part. This I will not use this. I'll just use it the copper pot. So what happens? I put it in at nine percent alcohol. It will come out around ninety, about forty-five proof, ninety percent alcohol. So tell us that, man. You learned all this on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I googled it. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot of it on the internet. A lot of it in books. I, I remember I bought this really little book, How to Open a Micro Distillery for fifty thousand dollars a year. Wow. This guy in Texas did it. So I read that book and then, you know, read more books and started reading and going and then went to Moonshine University. And look, it sucked at the beginning. It was rough. Like right. I didn't know, like, I remember the first day I turned the still on, uh, I turned it on and ran out the door because I didn't know if it was gonna blow up or not. Wow. Yeah, and everything in here. I'll, I'll tell you, the most expensive things that I bought here, see these two windows up here? <laughs> I remember you telling me that. Blast proof. Right. Like, you could throw a bomb up there and those windows are not going to break. Wow. It's $20,000 of pain. Wow. Because of, you know, it could blow up. And it runs at really low PSI. It only runs like 12, 12 PSI's, right? right? But it's scary. Yeah. Like, you didn't know. And I have a pressure relief valve on it and don't know if that's going to work. So, right. only one time did it ever happen. <coughs> ever happened where I got a little scared. Wow. Well, that's cool. Can we taste some spice rum here? <coughs> I don't choke. That's one of my favorites. Again, no sugar added after distillation. Have you ever tasted a coconut? The coconut rum? Yeah, I have. Okay, so it's really good. No, no, again, no sugar. Cheers. I'm getting the taste of my own rum. Nice. Good. Like nice. that's that's the spice rums the the number two seller behind the coconut. The coconut is has taken off because you know most people drink Malibu, which is all a little sugar. bit of coconut rum, y'all. 
Nice. Crazy, huh? No sugar, huh? No sugar. Natural coconut. Nice. Two types of coconut. We use Thai coconut, raw Thai coconut. So then you take sweet. you take the white rum and you infuse it with yeah, spices so, and so real quick. White rum goes back into the still. Then I take 80 pounds of Thai coconut flesh, baby coconut, and I hang them in there in these bags, they're called super bags. I turn the still on, I get it up to 169 degrees and I turn it off. So it's basically steeping young coconut overnight. And then up there in that silver, like the bullet looking thing, it's called a vapor basket. I'll take 20, 20 pounds of toasted, sweet, condensed coconut, like the coconut we put on coconut cake, right. and I'll put it in there and I'll run a, run a vapor distillation over it. So the vapor passes over the coconut, so you get two types of coconut. Wow. Yeah, and that amazing. was the first time I did it. it was, we just got rid of the coast last week. Bro. That's sweet. Good. Well, Todd, I really appreciate Cedric, it. Cedric, thanks very thanks much. We appreciate it. Of course. We'll definitely stay in touch and uh, sure. appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yeah.